In 1939, Chrysler unveiled a diesel built to defy an era, an inline six engineered to haul heavy loads and sip fuel while gasoline ruled the roads. It was powerful, efficient, and decades ahead of its time. This diesel could have revolutionized trucking until Chrysler killed it. At a time when few dared, Chrysler built a diesel engine meant to revolutionize commercial trucking, the Dodge Diesel 331. This bold move didn't come out of nowhere. Innovation was in their DNA. Their pioneering use of hydraulic brakes back in 1924 had already proven that they were willing to challenge convention. Chrysler clearly wasn't a company content with the status quo. But diesel engines? That was a different challenge. By the late 1930s, diesel was niche in the U.S., almost alien to most truckers and manufacturers. The market was ruled by specialists like Cummins, Mack, and industrial engine manufacturers. These firms had mastered diesel's unique demands, harder materials, precise fuel injection, and combustion control far beyond gasoline tech. Instead of buying diesel engines, Chrysler decided to build their own in-house for their heavy-duty Dodge T84, T106, and T126 trucks, workhorses of their pre-war commercial lineup. They faced steep technical hurdles, mastering high compression ratios and injection systems, operating under intense pressure. They adopted advanced technologies like the Lenovo pre-combustion chamber system to manage diesel's unique demands. New manufacturing techniques and tighter tolerances stretched their factories and teams, all while the market remained skeptical. Diesel was seen as complex, costly, and hard to maintain. America's diesel fueling infrastructure was sparse. Unlike Europe, where diesel was beginning to find acceptance in commercial applications, though still limited compared to later decades. Most U.S. operators stuck with gas rigs, familiar service networks, and guaranteed fuel availability. Still, Chrysler's engineers and leaders believed diesel was the future. They saw a chance to boost fuel efficiency, deliver torque for heavy loads, and build engines that lasted under harsh conditions. This vision put them ahead of many competitors, betting on diesel long before the market was ready. Their in-house diesel program wasn't just business strategy. It was a calculated bet on technology that would change freight hauling forever, if only the market had followed. Built on the same block as the T43 Dodge HD gasoline truck engine, the Dodge Diesel 331 retained a familiar base but introduced groundbreaking new features. At its heart was the Lenovo Air Chamber, a pre-combustion system licensed from Lenovo but branded internally as the Twin Cyclone. This design aimed to tame diesel's notoriously harsh combustion, making the engine both durable and efficient. Here's how it worked. Fuel injected into the combustion chamber didn't ignite all at once. Instead, roughly 40% of the fuel ignited first inside a smaller pre-chamber called the energy cell. The air inside that cell was hotter and denser than the main cylinder, creating ideal ignition conditions. Pressure in the energy cell could spike to 1100 PSI, a controlled but intense burst. The flame then rapidly spread into the larger main chamber, where peak pressure often dropped near 700 PSI. This staged combustion smoothed out violent pressure spikes common in early diesels, reducing wear, extending engine life, and improving fuel economy. It was an elegant solution to a brutal problem. The engine's physical layout reflected this innovation. Each cylinder had its own intake and exhaust ports, a design that improved airflow and combustion efficiency beyond typical diesels of the era. Fuel delivery came from Bosch injectors rated at 2200 PSI, fed by a gear-driven injection pump mechanically linked to the camshaft for precise timing and durability. This mechanical system ensured reliability in the tough world of trucking, avoiding electronic complexities decades ahead of their time. The design's simplicity also helped mechanics diagnose and repair issues without specialized equipment, an important feature given the era's limited roadside support. Starting a diesel in cold weather is no easy task, and Chrysler tackled this with a heating coil mounted atop the intake manifold.
This simple but effective feature warmed incoming air, helping the engine fire quicker on chilly mornings, an essential detail for trucks operating in all climates. The cold start system wasn't just convenience, it kept rigs moving when downtime meant lost contracts and revenue. Considering diesel engines generally struggle with cold starts due to fuel ignition temperature, this solution was critical to operational reliability. Chrysler carefully thought about maintainability in their engine. Injection timing could be adjusted via an access plate on the front cover, allowing mechanics to fine-tune combustion based on fuel quality or conditions without engine disassembly. In an era before electronic controls, this meant minimal downtime and quick roadside fixes, a rarity in diesels back then, especially from a first-time diesel builder. Such practical design choices acknowledge the harsh realities truckers faced on long hauls, far from repair shops. Every detail of the 331 diesel embodied rugged dependability. Its advanced combustion design reduced engine stress and extended service life. While features like individually ported cylinders and high-pressure Bosch injectors enhanced power delivery and efficiency, both essential for easier maintenance in demanding conditions. This blend of innovation and practicality aimed squarely at reducing total ownership costs, a key selling point for fleet operators. The engine's seven main bearing crankshaft, robust block design, and overhead valve setup further enhanced durability and power delivery. Together with the combustion system, this created a diesel not just built to run. It was built to keep running, mile after mile, haul after haul, proving innovation can thrive in the toughest environments. Chrysler's engineers clearly understood that durability and serviceability mattered as much as raw power in commercial trucking. Chrysler didn't just design the 331 cubic inch diesel engine on paper. They tested it head-to-head -head against gasoline power. In controlled trials, the diesel-powered T84 faced off against the gasoline-driven T80, revealing striking fuel efficiency differences. At a steady 2400 RPM, the diesel consumed 6.6 .6 gallons per hour, while the gas engine guzzled 10.7 gallons. At 800 RPM, the gasoline engine's consumption remained unchanged, but the diesel dropped dramatically to 4.3 gallons per hour. This wasn't a small advantage. It meant longer hauls and lower costs, critical in an era where fuel mattered. Technically, the engine packed solid specs. 331 cubic inches, inline six-cylinder, four-stroke diesel. It produced 95 to 100 horsepower at 2400 RPM and 240 pound-feet of torque at 800 to 1200 RPM. With a bore of 3.75 inches, a 5-inch stroke, and a 14.75 to 1 compression ratio, it was built for steady, heavy-duty work, reliable torque where it counted. Its electrical system was a dual-voltage setup. The diesel required 24 volts for starting, using four 6-volt batteries, but operated on a 6-volt system otherwise. This required two generators, one 24-volt unit and one 6-volt unit. This robust configuration ensured dependable starting and smooth operation under tough conditions, reflecting Chrysler's focus on real-world reliability. The engine's torque curve favored low-end power, making it ideal for hauling heavy loads without the need to rev high. Its fuel injection system, mechanically timed and gear-driven, used Bosch injectors rated at 2,200 pounds per square inch. Operators could adjust injection timing to suit different fuels or environmental conditions, a rare feature in that era. This adjustability allowed fleets to optimize performance depending on where and how their rigs were used. Despite the complexity, Chrysler aimed for a design that could withstand harsh use and minimize roadside breakdowns. However, they didn't make many. The total diesel truck production was only 606 units from 1939 to 1942, with additional marine and military units produced. While the Dodge Diesel 331 cubic inch engine was a landmark in American engineering, building it proved far more complicated than designing it. The production side of the story, often overlooked, is where many of the earliest cracks began to form. This wasn't a mass market engine. It couldn't be. From the start, it was a precision built machine in a company known for volume production. Chrysler had long mastered high output gasoline engines with 
interchangeable parts, and standardized lines. The 331 diesel, on the other hand, required much tighter tolerances, new machining routines, and different assembly protocols altogether. Though the block itself was adapted from Chrysler's proven T43 gasoline engine, nearly everything else, combustion chambers, injection system components, and internal balancing, was unique. These weren't parts you could just drop into existing workflows. Even small changes like fuel delivery pressure and pre-chamber alignment meant retraining line workers, altering jigs and fixtures, and adding new quality control steps. Each diesel engine had to be built with a level of precision more akin to aircraft production than truck assembly. This meant production was slow from the start. Chrysler didn't encounter catastrophic failures or mass recalls. The assembly process simply wasn't optimized. Diesel engines just couldn't be batched efficiently alongside gasoline engines. Even after retraining their labor force, achieving consistency at scale remained difficult. Chrysler never fully committed to a standalone diesel production line. Instead, the 331 was fit into the existing truck engine workflow as a side program, more of an internal experiment than a commercial mainstay. That decision had consequences. It limited the number of engines that could be produced, created bottlenecks in scheduling, and required workers to constantly shift between different assembly methods. Compounding these issues was the challenge of component sourcing. The engine's Bosch fuel injection system required tight manufacturing oversight and exact calibration. While Chrysler manufactured most of the engine in-house, some precision parts, especially injector components, had to be imported or licensed, introducing delays and cost fluctuations. In a time when supply chains were already complex, this added a layer of fragility to the program. Then came the war. World War II radically transformed Chrysler's priorities. The company became a central player in the U.S. war machine, retooling factories for tanks, aircraft engines, and other critical equipment. The most skilled machinists were reassigned to military contracts, and access to strategic materials like high-grade steel and copper was tightly rationed. Every company had to make choices, and Chrysler made theirs. Civilian truck engine production stopped after the 1941 model year. Although some diesel engines were still produced into 1942 for military or auxiliary use, the program no longer had institutional backing. The 331 engine's complexity didn't fit into the streamlined, volume-driven war economy. With factories operating 24-7 to meet government demand, a slow and specialized diesel engine just didn't make the cut. Interestingly, Chrysler never made a formal announcement ending the diesel's production. There was no memo, no press release, no final unit ceremony. It simply faded away. In retrospect, it's clear that the engine was too ambitious for its manufacturing context. Chrysler's production systems were built for scale, speed, and standardization. The 331 diesel asked for the opposite, so the engine's long-term viability was limited from the start. And yet, it wasn't a failure of engineering, it was a failure of alignment. Chrysler could build the engine. They just couldn't build it efficiently or at scale using the systems they already had. The result was a small run of highly capable engines with no practical way to mass-produce them. An innovation stuck between two eras. What ultimately sank the program wasn't flawed engineering, it was a lack of alignment between what Chrysler built and what the market actually needed. While in the 1940s, agricultural and marine sectors had some exposure to diesel engines, commercial diesel trucking was barely in its infancy. That meant most independent shops, and even Chrysler's own dealer network, weren't equipped to diagnose or repair diesel engines. Technicians trained on spark plugs and carburetors now faced injection pumps, compression ignition, and pre-combustion chambers. The learning curve was steep, and Chrysler didn't provide a clear path to it. Training programs for diesel techs were limited or non-existent, and literature was thin. Diagnostic tools, if they existed, weren't distributed widely. If a truck broke down on the road, getting it fixed quickly often wasn't possible. Even something as simple as fuel system troubleshooting could sideline a rig for days. That lack of technical infrastructure turned early adopters into frustrated pioneers, 
and cost operators both time and money. Then there was fueling. In the 1940s, America diesel infrastructure was fragmented at best. Outside of ports, rail yards, or certain industrial zones, diesel pumps were rare. Long-haul drivers couldn't rely on availability and had to build complex workarounds, carrying extra fuel or mapping routes around scarce filling stations. It's not that diesel was unknown, it just simply wasn't accessible to the average trucking operation. In a business where uptime and predictability are everything, that was a major liability. Chrysler was a gasoline-first company focused on passenger vehicles and light-duty trucks, so the diesel program, while impressive, existed on the periphery. There was no company-wide pivot to support diesel adoption, no sweeping initiative to overhaul service centers, expand training, or coordinate with fuel suppliers. In effect, Chrysler built a high-end diesel engine and dropped it into a system designed to support something else entirely. Meanwhile, dedicated diesel specialists were doing the opposite. Cummins, Detroit Diesel, and Mack were investing heavily in diesel-specific technologies, service education, and long-term client relationships. They didn't just sell engines, they sold ecosystems. Cummins, for example, built its reputation not just on performance, but on reliability, support, and its willingness to work directly with fleet operators. It took them years to gain traction, but when the market tipped toward diesel in the post-war years, they were ready. Chrysler wasn't. After the war, the company resumed its focus on gasoline engines and never revisited the 331 project. There was no relaunch, no revision, no attempt to bring it back under new conditions. It wasn't until 1989, nearly half a century later, that Chrysler entered the diesel market again, this time through a partnership with Cummins. By then, the company had accepted that diesel success required more than technical capability. It demanded specialization. This strategic withdrawal reflected a broader truth. Chrysler's culture, focused on mass market efficiency and rapid innovation, wasn't well suited for diesel's slower, more support-intensive rollout. The diesel market didn't reward bold one-offs. It rewarded companies willing to invest in long-term trust through service, training, and infrastructure. Chrysler's diesel experiment lacked that commitment. Chrysler's retreat resulted from multiple factors. Very low demand, competition from Detroit Diesel's two-stroke diesels, debuted in GMC trucks earlier in 1939, and post-war market conditions and strategic decisions. Their commitment to gasoline engines and lack of diesel-specific investment meant Chrysler missed a chance to shape the industry on its own terms. Still, this brief endeavor influenced Chrysler's later strategy, leading to partnerships with other diesel suppliers. In 1962, Chrysler used Perkins diesels, in 1978, Mitsubishi diesels, and in 1989, finally began the Cummins partnership that became widely known. And so the Dodge Diesel 331 became a historical footnote, a promising power plant let down by the ecosystem around it.